Okay, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Hello, hello. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to start. <clears throat> so, Tansi, good morning, bonjour. Um, so for people who were not here today, my name is Natalie Kermol. I'm the uh, director of the Rupertsland Center for Métis Research and also a professor and the associate dean academic of the uh, Faculty of Native Studies. So I'd like to welcome the people, welcome back, the people that were here yesterday. And didn't we have a great day yesterday? Yay! <laughs> and you were fantastic, like, uh, with all your questions and your comments. And also, I'm thinking of the people that, were, that uh, are actually online, watching us online, so I want to say a good morning to you too, and uh, also uh, for those who are coming today for that specific, uh, uh, the, the specific uh, uh, different talks, uh, welcome. So today uh, it will be more, I would say, lawyer focused from what I can see, <laughs> but it will be as interesting nonetheless. <laughs> um, so we, we move from somewhat from history uh, and case studies towards, uh, you know, like uh, thinking about land claims and, and uh, issues that are important for moving forward into the future. Um, so we will start with a prayer. So I'll ask uh, Norma to, to come here. And then after that, uh, Aaron Barner will, will take over. Thank you. Good morning. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Dear Lord, we are grateful for the wisdom of our historic and current Métis Provincial Council, our Métis Centre for Excellence, and the Univer University of Alberta Faculty of Native Studies for the opportunity to share the history of Métis script and land claims in Alberta. The gift of our Métis heritage invites us to be a part of a tradition that builds on the wisdom of the past with a vision open to the opportunities of the future. These gifts also challenge us to move beyond our norm, to broaden our imagination, and to deepen our trust in you, dear Lord. Fill us with enthusiasm and wonder as we receive these gifts with open minds, kind hearts, and a willing spirit. May we take full possession of this heritage and pass it on to those generous Métis men and women who walk behind us into the future. Father, we ask that you grant us the patience to endure all hardships, the wisdom to make a difference in the situations which we can control, and the understanding to navigate through the difficult times we all face. And when the end of the day approaches, let your magnificent peace settle our hearts and our minds. Please bless us as we gather for the second day of this conference. Guide our minds and hearts so that we continue to work for the good of our Métis community. Teach us to be trusting in our outlook, courageous in the face of difficulty, and wise in our decisions. We ask of all of these blessings in your name, O oh Lord. Amen. Thank you, Norma. Um, so we're going to start uh, the conference, and uh, I'll uh, ask Aaron Barner um, to come and, and start presenting our, um, our different uh, uh, com conference uh, speakers. Thank you.
Good morning. Uh, as mentioned, my name is, uh, is Aaron. I'm the Senior Executive Officer for the Métis Nation of Alberta, and I'll be the moderator for this morning. Um, just of note, um, similar to yesterday, we do have Q&A uh, sections on the agenda, so please hold your questions. Till then, and we'll be taking questions. I'm not sure if we have other people in the uh, overflow rooms or, or not, but we'll be taking questions from, from the mics in this room as well as um, um, from Facebook uh, on the live stream. Um, also to note, our lunch break today is at 1 o'clock, so have a nice snack at the, on the break. Um, so without uh, much more to say, um, I'd like our first panel to come up. Uh, Thomas Isaac and Zachary Davis and I'll start with their bios as they make their way up. So our first presentation is from Mr. Thomas Isaac, the need for a unique Métis claims process, Minister's Special Representative Report 2016 on Métis Section 35 rights. Thomas Isaac is a nationally recognized authority in the area of Aboriginal law and leads Castle, Castles, Brock and Blackwell National Aboriginal Law Practice. Mr. Isaac has served as a mediator involving complex multi-jurisdictional Aboriginal related disputes and has appeared before the courts and regulatory bodies across Canada, including the Supreme Court of Canada. In 2015, Mr. Isaac was appointed by Canada as the Minister's, Minister's Special Representative to the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations regarding Section 35 Métis Rights and Reconciliation. Mr. Isaac is presently serving as the Minister, Minister's Special Representative for the Crown Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations to conduct exploratory discussions regarding the Gottfriedson class action lawsuit against Canada relating to residential schools day students. Mr. Isaac is a member of the Law Societies of BC, Alberta, Northwest Territories, Nunavut, and the Yukon. He holds a BA, MA, LLB, and LLM. All right, for our second person up here, Mr. Zachary Davis. He's a senior associate with Pape Salter Taie who specializes in Indigenous rights law. Zachary's litigation practice focuses on a range of areas impacting Indigenous peoples, including constitutional law, administration law, and self-government issues. Zachary has appeared before the courts from coast to coast at all levels of appeal. He has also provided advice to Indigenous communities across the country regarding self-governance and rights assertions by helping with the development and implementation of Indigenous laws and policies in order to help communities assume effective control of their own governance and management. Zachary represents the Métis Nation of Alberta in its self-government negotiations with Canada. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Thomas Isaac to the podium. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, real pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, and uh, congratulations uh, to the Institute, uh, the Métis Nation of Alberta, as well, and the University for such a well-attended and uh, comprehensive uh, uh, agenda on uh, an area that has for so long uh, not received uh, its uh, due attention. So really congratulations to, uh, to everyone for such an impressive, uh, impressive uh, conference uh, outline. Um, I have uh, I've been asked today to to speak about uh, the report uh, that I issued uh, a few years ago to the government of Canada on Métis rights, and in particular, uh, talk about uh, one recommendation that uh, in that report that relates squarely to the theme of this year's uh, conference, dealing with outstanding Métis claims and the script process. So what I will do is, what I'd like to do is uh, give you some, before I jump into the discussion of the recommendation around uh, the need for a distinct Métis claims process uh, that isn't mixed in with Inuit or First Nations, uh, I want to set, sort of set the table on uh, a few key themes that uh, emerged in, and, and I would say are continue to be relevant uh, today uh, since uh, my report, that I think are directly relevant uh, to your conference, uh, to uh, the issue of outstanding Métis claims, and 
really to the importance of uh, continuing down the road of supporting uh, and funding, and particularly public governments, funding uh, Métis rights and claims-related research. It's uh, good for our country, and it's, uh, it's needed in the process of reconciliation. So uh, let, me, uh, let me just jump right into it, uh, given we've got a limited amount of uh, time. Uh, just very briefly, I was uh, appointed uh, the Minister's Special Representative in July 2015. Uh, that appointment was reaffirmed by the then uh, recently elected Liberal uh, government in December 2015. Uh, my report to uh, Minister Bennett was released in July 2016. Uh, I am independent. I was independent for the purpose of writing that report, and I am nonpartisan. And the mandate was uh, focused on, uh, and this was set out in Minister Bennett's letter to me, was the ultimate objective was reconciliation with Métis, and the specific elements of the mandate were to give advice around a process for developing Section 35 Métis rights framework and advice relating to the Supreme Court of Canada's decision in the Manitoba Métis Federation. But for those of you, and I know a number of you have heard me uh, speak on this point, for me what was important was what the objective, so the process-related advice, for those of you who are familiar with that report, you'll know that that's, that was probably the most straightforward part of the report. It's actually relatively simple in terms of giving advice on process. But it was with the objective of reconciliation. And for me, in carrying out uh, my, uh, my mandate, that was a critical piece and a critical set of lenses to view what is needed to make sure that the process actually leads to further reconciliation as opposed to process for the sake of process, which would, in my view, uh, defeat the very purpose of why I was appointed. So let me just very briefly touch on a couple of key points before I jump into the claims issue. And uh, again, for those of you who have heard me speak before, you'll know this is my the first point. I go to it every time I talk about the report. It's the first recommendation in my report. And it was my observation, and I stand by this observation, about the fundamental lack of knowledge around Métis rights, Métis history, Métis experience, and the importance of the Métis in the development of our great country. And it was palpable to me. Uh, again, I won't dwell on it today because of our limited time, but if we're serious about reconciliation, and whether you're a federal government or a provincial or a territorial government, you need to know who you're sitting across from. And one of the things we'll talk about a little bit later, and you've heard already from some, from some experts on this point, but the Métis experience, and I don't have to tell more, all of you in this room, you know this better than I do, is distinct. It may be related to the history of First Nations to some extent, but it is a distinct experience, and we know this. Therefore, if we're crafting claims processes, we're dealing with outstanding issues. If you don't understand that distinct perspective and you come at it from, let's say, a First Nations or an Inuit perspective, or I would say even worse, a pan-Aboriginal perspective, you're going to miss the very point of what the claim may be about and certainly miss the mark on achieving reconciliation. And I think we've got a history of that. And I would say we're seeing some changes, and I'll get to those in a minute. But this is the link back to education. And again, uh, the important work that the Institute does is absolutely essential in my view, uh, not only for the Métis, by the way, but for our public governments in terms of ensuring that, as I talk about in my report, the public monies are spent wisely. And as I say in my, my report, there is a, a, a very positive argument to invest in both research, and I comment on this in my report very, very specifically, that that is a good use of public monies to invest in Métis research so that we can understand our history, our collective history, better. But this point of education, what, what really struck me was coming across numerous examples, and again, I think in, I would say, almost all situations, people of goodwill 
but just fundamentally not understanding what the law is in our country, what the Métis experience has been. And one example that I've, that I've used um, uh, time and time again, I, in my report, I, I outline a number of myths that I kept hearing, and I'll only touch on one again, given the time, I'll only touch on one. But I, I heard continually from both uh, some federal officials and certainly some of the provinces. I mean, the provinces were quite challenging on the, on the prairies in particular, to be blunt. They were. And their views of the law did not align with what my understanding is of the case law. Uh, and by the way, when I say that, I don't mean the nuances of the case law. I mean the core case law. Uh, they didn't align. But, for example, one of the continued uh, assertions I heard was that treaty rights automatically trump Métis rights. And, and again, we know that not to be true. There's no case law that stands for that proposition. None. And yet, if that's the starting point, it doesn't take m much imagination to figure out you're going to have a pretty limited view on how you're going to deal with any Métis assertions of rights, of claims, outstanding grievances, and so on and so forth. So again, I'm sure we could probably spend the day talking about this issue of education, but I really do, every time I speak about these issues, I like starting there because... I, you know, we've got, I know we've got some government officials here today too, and I just think it's important that it be stressed about how important it is to understand the peoples that you are dealing with and their collective history and their collective uh, reality. Uh, another common theme I heard, for example, was this focused on mixed uh, ancestry. And you'll still see, you'll even see it in some of the case law. And obviously, that is a relevant historical reality for Métis. I don't, again, I don't have to tell anybody in this room. You know what that reality is. But when it comes to rights, the Supreme Court of Canada has gone out of its way. Uh, we could have a discussion about Daniels, because it seems, but certainly in Powley, where the court moves away from the focus being on mixed ancestry to the point of distinct culture, distinct heritage, distinct history, distinct practices, a distinct peoples that happens to also have an element of mixed ancestry, but a very different focus. We are talking about a distinct indigenous peoples uh, in Canada. And again, for those of you who have read my report, you know I, I spend a lot of time on this, going through the law, and, and I would argue the uncontroverted law, the very clear law, of the focus on the Métis being a distinct Aboriginal uh, peoples. Very briefly, in 2016, my observation was, and, and I could break this down uh, into some shocking uh, mathematical uh, uh, numbers, but what I, it was less than a fraction, and I would I should have added a significant fraction of 1% of the federal government's budget dedicated to indigenous peoples was dedicated to Métis distinctly. A significant fraction of 1%. The vast majority of the budget distinctly focused on First Nations, distinctly focused on Inuit, or under the guise of what I would call pan-Aboriginal, which in many instances was oriented more towards First Nation. I said many instances, not all. There are a few examples, and I tried to note a few of them in my report that seem to be a bit more balanced, but by and large, distinctly leaning towards a First Nation viewpoint. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with the First Nation's viewpoint, but we're here to talk about Métis. And what I kept hearing from government, I would say governments, including the provinces that I met with, some of them, was that, well, really the pan-Aboriginal funding is really meant for the Métis anyway. And the problem with that, in my view, remember my mandate about furthering reconciliation, and what I kept hearing from Métis governments, what I kept hearing from Métis institutes and organizations, was that they were being left behind. They have a different experience than First Nations in many, many instances. And that they needed distinct programming to deal with their distinct 
socioeconomic situation, geographic location, distinct way they exercise their rights. And uh, so from my point of view, and what I mentioned in my report, uh, which had come out right around the same time as Daniel's, was that it was critical that Government of Canada apply a more equitable approach to how it disperses funding. And it is my view that looking at the principle of the honor of the crown, that there is a positive obligation on Canada. And I've been very public about this, uh, of um, looking at how it spends money as the federal government and uh, ensuring that that spend is equitable and clearly a fraction of 1% for distinct Aboriginal peoples who actually have the highest population among our indigenous peoples in this country, uh, there's a problem. On its face, there is a problem. So back in 2016, there was, uh, in 2015, excuse me, actually 2015, the MMF process was at a standstill. There was a significant declaration from the Supreme Court of Canada that Canada breached the honor of the crown, and yet nothing was uh, happening on the ground. We saw numerous examples within the department uh, federally of Métis rights not getting, or Métis peoples not getting really any attention by the federal crown. And very much still the debate about Métis are not federal responsibility. And of course, then you have many of the provinces going, Métis are not provincial uh, responsibility, uh, notwithstanding that they're citizens in their own province. Mind you, they say that about First Nations people too, if there's any consolation in that. Um, and so at the end of the day, the advice in the report was, of course, the Métis Section 35 rights framework is the right thing to do. It furthers reconciliation. It must be based on a thorough understanding of Canadian law and a thorough understanding of the Métis uh, reality and history. And of course, the Supreme Court of Canada's declaration of a breach of the honor of the crown in Manitoba Métis Federation decision must be actioned immediately, which it was. So I won't go through these slides in detail, but really since late 2015 and early 2016, we have seen, including, by the way, with the Métis Nation of Alberta, significant and uh, progress uh, being made. And I'm not at all suggesting that we're done or you're done, uh, but you cannot help but look at the evidence and see significant uh, progress. I will not go through each one of these given the time, but I did put them on a couple of slides of all the various mechanisms and MOUs and governance agreements and funding agreements and consultation protocols, primarily with the government of Canada and uh, Métis governments, uh, including significant uh, budget uh, allocations. And again, I'm not a, an apologist here for the federal government. I look at evidence. And I think it's clear that from the evidence over the past few years, w at least Canada seems to be going in the right direction. We still have some challenges with some of the provinces, which I'll get to in a moment. And it keeps going. This is now three slides that are fairly full um, on, on progress. So let me talk a little bit about Métis claims. What I note in my report is that outside of litigation, the Métis currently have no formal means of pursuing claims relating to Section 35 rights or other land-related rights before Canada, uh, the provinces, and including the Northwest Territories. The current comprehensive claims, and you're going to hear from uh, Doug Eifert a, a little bit later, and I know he commented on this as well, but the current comprehensive land claims policy deals with outstanding Aboriginal title, and it is very focused towards the First Nations uh, experience. And then technically within the system, the federal system, there's no allowance for Métis claims to come forward under that policy. The current specific claims policy, so that's comprehensive claims, 
Uh, and we, of course, we know there's a process underway right now to uh, Canada's looking at its comprehensive claims policy, which I think is a positive initiative to see whether uh, changes need to be made. And I think everybody's in agreement that it needs to, changes need to be made. Then you move to the specific claims policy, and the current policy is restricted to First Nations. Métis can't bring claims under the specific claims policy on its face. And then finally, there is a special claims policy. And there, theoretically, you could argue that Métis claims could come forward. Uh, but there is no established process within the special claims policy uh, to deal with Métis claims, which in many ways, and again, many of you are much more expert on this than I am, are distinct and they're uniquely Métis. They're not like First Nation claims, for the most part. You'll find the odd example here and there that will uh, line up more with a First Nation type claim, but the vast majority of them are distinctly Métis. And they don't fit. There is no policy framework to deal with them. And of course, the provinces have nothing. I mean, there's just at least, I, I'm, I'm focusing here on the federal policies because at least there are some policies to focus on around claim settlement. And then at the end of the day, even under the special claims process, you've got to go to cabinet every time you want to do something under that policy. So from a very practical point of view, even if you were able to squeeze a Métis claim in there, uh, you're talking about uh, easily a multi-year process just to get a single claim uh, acknowledged, and to date there have been uh, none of which I'm aware. Uh, this, of course, is not an all-inclusive list, but in my report I outlined a number of uh, claims, including the uh, claim that is in before the courts in northwest Saskatchewan, and I, these are simply examples, so uh, please, there's many, many more, as, again, many of you will know. Obviously, the script commissions, uh, the Treaty 3 adhesion, very unique uh, situation. Uh, the pasture lands policy, which I'll be honest, prior to my work as the MSR, I really was quite ignorant of, and I probably still am in terms of uh, uh, many of the experts in the room, but from my point, I was really quite, like, nobody knows this history outside a select few who have had to experience it directly and experience, and I've had the fortunate opportunity of talking to people who are directly affected by these policies of taking away land. Um, uh, Isla La Crosse is another example, and, you know, the role of the province of Saskatchewan there, for example, and many other claims. But if you look at that list, they are distinctly Métis. Many of them. I mean, I'm sure First Nations may have a, a complaint or two about the weapons range, but some of the, there are mechanisms for the First Nation claims to be dealt with. There are no mechanisms for Métis, and that's wrong. I mean, it's just that simple. Under Canadian law, it's wrong, and in terms of our aggressive public policy approach in this country towards reconciliation, it's wrong and it needs to be amended. And that was the, the core of my, my report. So before I get to the actual recommendation, there were 17 recommendations in my report. Uh, all 17, there are a number that have been implemented. Most are in the process of, I am told, being implemented, although time will tell whether they are fully implemented. Recommendation number uh, three deals with Canada needing to review its existing policies. Um, and that's really all of them. All of its policies, programs, and services, every single one of them dealing with Indigenous peoples through the lens of their obligation to treat Métis peoples equitably. And this flows... Uh, in large part from the honor of the Crown. And again, I won't dwell on these recommendations. We could talk all morning about any one of them. Uh, the regional offices uh, of, uh, at that time, Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada, um, th these are the people on the ground. They need to start embracing the Métis element of the department's mandate. And where we saw that particularly challenging was in the prairies. There's a real problem. And again, many of you will know this, where they, the regional offices are heavily weighted. And look, for historical reasons, dealing with reserve land and all the other things that have been set up around the Indian Act, 
But that's not an excuse. It may be the reason, but it's not an excuse for ignoring the reality of uh, treating uh, Métis peoples equitably on the ground from at least a federal uh, perspective. And this is key, again, in my view, to practical reconciliation on the ground. It's one thing to have a policy, but people need to know that they can engage with their government, uh, their public government, uh, in a meaningful way. Uh, the need for a whole of department, and I would actually change that now to whole of government approach to dealing with Métis issues. This idea of, well, we've got a branch. And by the way, no offense to the branch. <laughs> uh, it's nice to have a branch. But these issues, we know this to be true. Whether you're Inuit, First Nations, or Métis, these issues demand a whole of government approach. We know this. And this idea of segmenting it up into, well, it's a department, we've got a branch within the department. If the whole department and the whole government isn't focused on what the proper objective is, you see the dysfunction. And again, we could dwell on this one. I'm going to keep moving because of my time. Now, recommendation number nine. And this is the recommendation that I wanted to really draw to your attention. And I'll just read it to you. It is recommended that Canada either amend its existing comprehensive land claims and specific claims policies or develop a new policy that expressly addresses Métis Section 35 rights claims and related issues and the basis for such amended policies or a new policy be founded on the legal principles of reconciliation and the honor of the Crown. Not just a policy approach. You base it on your legal obligations. It is also recommended, and I believe the second point, and for those of you who, again, who have read my report, I was reporting to Minister Bennett, federal minister, I did not leave the provinces alone. This notion that this all falls on the federal government is false. Law doesn't support it. Doesn't support it at all. And by the way, including for First Nations and Inuit, I might add. And the provinces have got to step up. And for Métis, again, for living, Métis living in Manitoba, very familiar with what's, what's happening there. Saskatchewan, Alberta. There are real challenges with the provinces. And so my second part to this recommendation, number nine, is it is also recommended that Canada should work with the appropriate provinces and territories to develop a joint process by which to address unresolved Métis Section 35 rights, claims, and related issues. Do not leave the provinces out of it. They may want to be left out of it, but they should not be left out of it. And it's just wrong. And again, it's not consistent with the law. If you're dealing with harvesting rights on the ground, again, many of you will know this much better than I do. You're dealing with the provincial regulatory regime. You're dealing with provincial enforcement on the ground. And so we need to see our provinces step up. There is a need for a distinct Métis-centric claims policy to address outstanding Métis Section 35 claims and related issues, including land and the history of script and the consequences of it. Not only the Canada, but the provinces as well. The policy needs to be focused on the honor of the Crown and reconciliation as legal principles. First Nations specific policies by their nature are problematic for pragmatic and principled reasons. It's a different reality. And I won't belabor that point because I know you all know that. And likewise, this pan-Aboriginal approach, and while I understand why the term indigenous has become, and again, I'm not here to criticize the use of the term, the problem with that term, though, from a Métis perspective, and it may not be a problem for First Nations, who've got 150 years of history of dealing with Canada, with well-established process, albeit perhaps flawed, but nevertheless, is that it's easy to discount the distinct nature of the Métis Nation and of Métis Section 35 rights. And I am of the view that the term is not particularly helpful to the Métis for that reason. It's not a bad term in and of itself, but we need to educate Canada 
on the distinct nature of Métis peoples and the use of this broad term indigenous while, and, and aboriginal. While technically legally correct under Section 35, you'll see throughout my report a few people comment. I use the phrase Métis Section 35 rights, I think it's about 160 times in my very short report. Well, it was deliberate. It was very, very deliberate to underscore that we're not talking about derivatives from First Nation rights, we're not talking about Aboriginal rights, we're talking about Métis rights. And once that set of, again, I talk about lenses goes on, the policies around resolving claims must address in a material way the unique nature of those Métis rights and the unique Métis experience. And of course, there is currently a federal initiative to revise the comprehensive claims policy. Challenges ahead, and then I'll, I'll uh, finish. Look, we've seen radical changes. I, I think demonstrably, again, not saying it's enough. I'll leave that to all of you to, to talk about. But when you look at the evidence, certainly from a federal point of view, we have seen a radical change in approach from a denial of ever having to deal with Métis to an embracing of wanting to come to the table. And again, that doesn't mean everything is correct and there's no challenges ahead. There are challenges ahead. Not everything's correct. But there seems to be a pathway forward there. I don't think the same can be said particularly for the Prairie Provinces. I think that there's a challenge there still that remains. Um, we've got this whole issue of the interpretation of Daniels, the use of the term indigenous in Daniels is a challenge. Provincial approaches to Métis. Um, I pick on Manitoba in particular, uh, but also Saskatchewan and Alberta. Uh, elements of Canada and the provinces still seem to be taking this pan-Aboriginal, non-distinct Métis approach, and that needs to change. And I think it's been a struggle for Canada for so long, having dealt with Aboriginal or Métis as a, as a pan issue, there are still challenges within, but we are seeing progress. At the end of the day, um, a distinct uh, Métis Section 35 claims process isn't only the right thing to do. It's a good thing for our country that we come to terms with what Section 35 means vis-a-vis -vis Métis peoples and their rights, but it's also legally required, in my view on a proper interpretation of the honor of the crown and the legal principle of reconciliation enunciated by the Supreme Court of Canada. So uh, there in about 27 minutes are my uh, uh, initial, uh, or some thoughts on uh, the need for a distinct Métis claims process, so thank you. All right, so I think uh, that was a great presentation. We'll move on with Zach. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Isaac. I'm not sure how to actually get your presentation up here, though. Good morning, everyone. We heard yesterday, in particular from Dr. Frank Tuff, that script was a travesty. And we heard this morning from Tom Isaac that something needs to be done about it. There needs to be an avenue opened up to pursue reconciliation in respect to script. What I propose today is to offer a sketch of what a legal claim seeking reconciliation in respect of script might look like. Now, Script is a big, complicated issue. It was different as you moved across the prairies. This is sort of a, a pan script claim proposal. So some of the details are necessarily going to be fuzzy, and I can't win the case in 30 minutes. But we're going to do our best. This approach is based on the MMF case. 
So to understand what I'm proposing here, we need to understand a little bit about the MMF case. Jason Madden talked about that yesterday, but I'm going to give a brief overview so that we're all in the same place. We all know the history. Most Canadians don't, but everyone in this room knows this history. Canada is a young country. John A. Macdonald's ambitions look west. In order to do that, he needs, first of all, to get the land from the Hudson's Bay Company nominally, and then settle the claims of the indigenous people living in the land. The biggest population center is in Red River. There are 12,000 people there. 10,000 of them are Métis. 7,000 of them are Métis children. That Métis population, it turns out quite rightly, suspects that the new government will not recognize and respect their land rights. So under the leadership of Louis Riel, they declare a provisional government and they negotiate in terms of union. And one of the most important terms of union of the province is the promise of 1.4 million acres of land to the Métis children. This is a constitutional promise. It's set out in the Manitoba Act, which is included in the Constitution of Canada. And in good Canadian fashion, Canada rags the puck. They don't deliver on the promise in anything like a timely way. And the purpose of this promise is defeated. The Métis don't end up benefiting from the land. They don't get the head start in their homeland that they were promised, and they scatter across the prairies. <clears throat> this is confirmed by the Supreme Court of Canada in the Manitoba Métis Federation case in 2013, where the court says that the federal crown failed to implement the land grant provision set out in section 31 of the Manitoba Act in accordance with the honor of the crown. This is you know, the, the great legal victory so far in pursuing Métis claims. So how could we build a case that looks like this to reconcile the wrongs that were committed in the script system? Uh, this is a script commission, by the way. This is the Treaty 8 script commission. I like this picture because I think it really captures the power imbalance in what are sometimes referred to as the script negotiations. This was, in terms of a, a unilateral, inflexible contract, uh, this is the best example. There was no negotiation. It was an application. And you can see the Métis kneeling down in front of the, the panel of white people who have come to uh, give them a coupon for their collective inheritance. It has been pointed out to me that I don't know for sure that the people kneeling down are Métis. That is true. But I am certain that the people at the table are white because they came to take, and so they certainly took the best seats. <laughs> The argument I'm going to make breaks down like this. You need first to start with a constitutional promise. I'll explain what that is. Um, then you need a legislative grant. I'll explain where that comes from. I'll get into why the purpose of the promise set out in those two instruments was defeated. I'm going to get into the Métis response because that is important when it comes to defeating possible defenses that Canada might put up, like limitations and latches. And then I want to talk about the fallout and what the remedy might be. The constitutional obligation. <clears throat> so MMF says, when the issue is the implementation of a constitutional obligation to an Aboriginal people, the honour of the Crown requires that the Crown, one, takes a broad and purposive approach to the interpretation of the promise, and two, acts di diligently to fulfil it. So we have a duty of diligent implementation, and this is what success in MMF really turned on. So what's our promise? The promise comes from the agreement reached between the British Crown, the Dominion, and the Hudson's Bay Company when it comes to the transference of the territory. And in that agreement, um, it stated that upon transference of the territories in question to the Canadian government, the claims of the Indian tribes to compensation for lands required for the purposes of settlement will be considered and settled in conformity with the equitable principles which have uniformly governed the British Crown and its dealings with the Aborigines. So we have a duty of equitable settlement. Now, the British Crown across the world has been far less than equitable in its dealings with Aborigines. So it's a weird yardstick. But when it is thinking well of itself, um, British common law articulates some noble principles in how it ought to deal with Aboriginal people. And that is the measure against which we need to uh, measure Crown behavior. I want to point out, too, that there has long been a debate about whether or not that was a real constitutional promise, despite the fact that it was in the Constitution. 
And the uh, the court in the Yukon has recently confirmed that, in fact, that that is a real constitutional promise. So what are some of these principles by which we should measure the Crown's behavior? Uh, the first is that, and this was a really essential part of uh, British colonial policy. When they moved into a territory, Aboriginal peoples possessed pre-existing laws and interests, and the British recognized their continuance. F now, looking back, people often dispute that this was really the policy, but if you think about the time, it was absolutely necessary. If the British were going to roll into India or roll into Kenya, they couldn't expect everyone just to know, understand, and follow the common law right away. They needed to recognize the laws of the territory and administer them. And it was the same thing in Canada. <clears throat> Another principle is that an Aboriginal claim to land is clearly a foundational right. Aboriginal people being born of and so closely related to the land, it is hard to understand what kind of claim would be more central. And British law was quite clear that although um, Aboriginal people's claims to land could be taken from them, it could only be done uh, if there was a solemn treaty and due compensation paid. So was there due compensation? And finally, and this is set out in the Royal uh, Proclamation of 1763, there should be an absence of great frauds and abuses. I mean, not exactly the highest standard, no great frauds and abuses. But when we get to the script story, we will see that it is rife with both. Legislative grant. How is this constitutional promise put into practice? It is put into practice, oh, so it, that this is important too because Manitoba Métis Federation tells us that the honor of the crown requires the crown to act in a way that accomplishes the intended purpose of a statutory grant. So we need to look at what the purpose of the grant is and whether or not the crown acted in a way that might fulfill it. What's the grant? The grant is set out in the Dominion Lands Act. And the Dominion Lands Act, in its various forms, it was modified through the years, always says that the claims of the half-breed to their Indian title, so Métis claims to land, uh, could be settled by granting land to such persons. So the purpose the the, of the statutory grant is that the Métis, for their claims, get land. It was articulated a little more simply in the 1899 version, that the government in council may grant lands in satisfaction of claims of half-breeds arising out of the extinguishment of their Indian title. <clears throat> and throughout the late 19th century, the government was quite clear that it intended to deal with the Métis as unindigenous people, they didn't use the word, an, an aboriginal or an aborigine uh, Indian tribe, an indigenous people in the prairies on the same footing as First Nations. Uh, this was articulated by Wilfrid Laurier and by Clifford Sifton, who was the Minister of Interior of the time, who was really responsible for rolling this out. So how did they implement the promise? They did it through scrip, right? And we talked about some of the details of scrip yesterday, but it's important to understand how the system worked so that we can understand how the system failed. And here I really have to thank Frank, who's done... Um, the best work out there on trying to explain this really complicated and convoluted system. But in order to, to do this, we need to walk through how it might have been rolled out. The Dominion Lands Act, as we saw, um, creates a statutory basis for dealing with Métis. Then you need a, an order in council, which establishes a script commission, a group of people, a body that are empowered to go out and grant lands in satisfaction of Indian title to half. So the script commission goes out onto the prairies and they take applications. They take applications from uh, individual Métis claimants who want to get their script. Uh, those applications are accompanied by a, a witness statement. And if they're filled out to the satisfaction of the commission, these people are given a certificate. The certificate isn't your land, right? The Métis claimant then has to take the certificate, send it in the mail to Ottawa, to the Dominion Lands Branch, where they will process the certificate and turn it into a coupon. The coupon will be sent back out to the prairies. The coupon is not your land. 
The person then has to take the coupon, find a Dominion Lands office, go to the Dominion Lands office, locate where they want the lands to be. Then that's all sent back to Ottawa in the mail and processed again. If that's done correctly, through the mail, again, back to the prairies, is sent letters patent to the land itself, and finally, the Métis claimant gets their land. So, I mean, this is not exactly uh, 21st century communication network. You can't just email these things back and forth. It takes years to get a process like this done, but it is also a masterpiece of British colonialism. I look at it like the Indian trains, just reams of paper being produced so that they can justify the greatest swindle in, in uh, Western Canadian land swindling history. <laughs> so so how, does, how does it work? We've got an order in council, establishes a commission. They put up public notices uh, so that people know that the commissions are coming through. Uh, here's our commission again, uh, where they take the applications. They uh, issue a certificate to a successful applicant. Oh, this is the application, sorry. They fill out the application. Uh, if the application is successful, they issue the certificate to the successful applicant, who then sends it in the mail uh, to Ottawa. <laughs> uh, it comes back from the mail, where you get a coupon, a great-looking coupon. You now need to find a Dominion Lands office, which was harder to do than you might think. I'll get to that. Once you've found a Dominion Lands office and you have located your lands, you send it in the mail to Ottawa. And if you are successful, you get your letters patent. This happened in almost no percent of the cases, right? We talked about this yesterday, um, and I'm going to get into more detail on that. But this was designed to be difficult. And there were a number of inequities that run through this system. <clears throat> One of the main inequities, or the main inequities, on which the Supreme Court hung its hat in the Manitoba Métis Federation case was the issue of delay. This goes back to when we talk about why I start with the constitutional promise is because when there's a constitutional promise, there's a duty of diligence to implement it. If you fail in the duty of diligence, if there's too much delay, you fail in the promise, the behavior is unconstitutional. And in the prairies, with Scrip, there was certainly delay. The promise is made and constitutionalized in 1870. Uh, within a reasonable number of years, the government is moving across the prairies to settle the claims of indigenous people, but not Métis, First Nations. They signed Treaty 6 in 1876. They try and sign Treaty 7 in 1877. The Métis, of course, see what's going on, and they're frustrated. What about their claims? And they start petitioning the government. In 1877, at Blackfoot Crossing, they petition for assistance to settle land. In 1878, in the Cypress Hills, they petition for a reserve. In 1879, finally, now nine years later, the government passes the legislation that would empower them to deal with the claims, the Dominion Lands Act. But they don't do it right away. And in 1888, Métis in Alberta continued to petition. Métis in St. Albert asked the government to survey their lands. What did the government do? Um, President Poitras said this yesterday in her opening remarks. The government does not nothing. They do worse than nothing. They open, they open the land up for settlement. And this is the first great wave of settlement in the early 1880s coming in to the Prairie Provinces. The Métis are understandably frustrated. They have tried democratic means. They've tried petitioning. There is a, pr a constitutional promise and a legislative grant that would allow the government to settle their claims, and the government does nothing. So the Métis organize. And this is uh, the Northwest resistance the second provisional government under Louis Riel, um, which of course is put down at Batoche and Riel is executed. That is the catalyst to begin the script system. And it's important to understand that because we're now 15 years after the promise was made and it took an armed insurrection for Canada to start taking these claims seriously. And it's not just me that says this. James Brady, who of course was a founding member of the Métis Nation of Alberta, said as much. I want to read this all, it's a little long, but he's very articulate. The way in which the government officials treated the just demands of the Métis was inexcusable and contributed to bring about the rebellion. 
Had they had the votes like the white men, or if, like the Indians, they had been numerous enough to command respect and overall red tape, without doubt the machinery of government would have functioned for them. But being only half-breeds, they were put off with eternal promises until patience ceased to be a virtue. It was callous and cruel neglect of this portion of the population that led to armed insurrection. As a result of this, the script system does begin to roll out. But it doesn't roll out with what I would say honorable diligence. Uh, we have now kind of the second great wave of um, white settlement coming into the prairies. And there's a bungling in the way script is dealt with in the southern part of the province of Alberta where commissions have to go back and are still going back in 1900 to settle Métis uh, script claims. And there is no commission uh, even established in northern Alberta in Treaty 8 territory until 1899. And it runs for about 10 years. So that's the first great inequity. Another one is really the unavailability of land offices. And this is particularly poignant in uh, Treaty 8 territory. Remember, if you want to locate your land, you want to actually get the land for your coupon, you have to go directly to the office. Well, the commission for the Treaty 8 script ran through Treaty 8 territory from 1899 to 1908. But there was no office open in Gruard until 1909. There was no office open um, in Peace River until 1910. And in Grand Prairie, there was no office until 1911. There was just no place to redeem this coupon. Um, and it was a huge part of the inequity and the reason why Métis thought that Scrib was not worth its face value and sold it to speculators because it was really far too difficult for them to redeem. Another major issue is that in a vast majority of cases, it couldn't be redeemed for the kinds of lands that the Métis would have wanted. Uh, you can see, uh, probably more clearly on the big screen, there's the dotted line there. The dotted line is the uh, 53rd parallel. And at the beginning of the 20th century, 75% of Métis people lived above the 53rd parallel. The shadowy gray area on the map are lands open for settlement, which are almost all below the 53rd parallel. Those are the only lands for which you could redeem your script coupon. So if you wanted to get any land for your coupon, you had to agree to displace yourself, to uproot yourself, and to go into a new homeland. There was also the issue of disenfranchisement. It was not every Métis person that was um, eligible for script. If you had fought in the 1885 resistance, if you had joined the resistance but not fought, or if you were the widow or a child of a person who had fought in the resistance, you were disenfranchised. Uh, even just you know having married a person that signed up but didn't fight meant that in the government's eyes, you had no rights to your land. This one's a little complicated, but it's important to understand because it really highlights the discrimination at play. As a general rule, <clears throat> if you were cashing in your script coupon, so you're locating it in the language, you go to the Dominion Lands Office and you pick a plot of land. Let's say you have a, a coupon for 240 acres, but the plot you want is 200 acres. You can get the plot, but Canada won't give you change. They'll just keep the extra 40 acres, right? Now, if you were a land speculator who had bought up a whole bunch of scrip, by the beginning of the 20th century, you could set up an account with the Dominion Lands Office. And you could draw from that account the exact amount when you were locating it. So say you had 5,000 acres in the account, but you wanted to locate for the 200, you could do it. Basically, they were willing to give white people change. They were not willing to give Métis people change. As Frank explained yesterday, there were two kinds of script. There was money script and land script. Um, the rule of location where the grantee has to show up at the office applied to land script. Uh, money script was more of a bearer bond. It could be uh, used by anyone that was holding it. But there were still inequities uh, with respect to money script, and particularly this comes from the delay. This was also an issue in the Manitoba Métis Federation case. The idea behind money script is that it was valued at a dollar per acre. So if you had an entitlement to 240 acres, it'd give you a script for $240. But land prices rose very sharply. So you know, only a few years later, 
land was valued at two dollars an acre. Um, and by between 1905 and 1930, the average price of a homestead went up to fourteen dollars an acre. So your two hundred and forty dollars worth of script was not going to get you the land to which you had originally been entitled. And that is a consequence of the delay, but it's certainly an inequity. <clears throat> Uh, this is the, the language from MMF talking about how this delay with respect to money's grip is an inequity. And then finally, there's the issue of fraud, just straight up fraud. And this comes with um, the issue around locating your land grip. Uh, land grip had to be located by the person to whom it was granted, the Métis person whose name was on the coupon. And because all of this land script had been bought up by speculators and the Métis people were no longer anywhere to be found by them, in a huge number of cases, the speculators employed another Métis person, a First Nations person, to impersonate them fraudulently and pretend that they were them. They committed this fraud in order to locate the land script. It was very well known. Uh, this is a description of it. Uh, in a legal memo of the Department of Justice in 1921, and Frank went into great detail yesterday about just how well known this fraud was. So what's the fallout? As far as I know, and I would love for the study to be done, there has been no study done all across the prairies of how many people were issued scrip and how many Métis people actually got the land. But in those regional areas where studies have been done, it's somewhere between 90 and 98 percent of the land ends up in the hands of white land speculators. It's really a minute fraction of any of this entitlement to land that translates into real land in the hands of Métis people. Um, there was, I'll just quote this last one, there are a number of examples of this, but when the Métis Nation of Alberta was looking into this at the beginning of the 1980s. They interviewed 120 families about their script experience and found none of them that had gotten any land out of script. And uh, this was produced for the m and AGA last year. And it's, it's set out in more detail in the script booklet that I think has been uh, circulating around at this conference, which is a great piece of work. Um, in that case, in Lac La Biche, could only confirm that about 1% of Métis grantees actually acquired any land from Scrip. In 74% of the cases, it was assigned to a third party, not Métis, and in the remaining cases, there just wasn't the documents to figure out who it went to. So what was the Métis response? The Métis response is important because it is a part of how a legal claim would be advanced to show that the government couldn't use a defense of limitations or latches. So limitations is, is a statutory limit on the amount of time you can wait before you bring a, a claim to court. And in MMF, the court said that those kinds of limitations don't bar claims about the unconstitutional behavior of government. So if you're advancing a claim of this nature, that the government failed to diligently implement this constitutional promise, you don't have to worry about limitations. You might have to worry about what's called latches. And latches is the idea that if uh, I do a bad thing to you, but then you do nothing about that, you kind of sit on it and, and don't react, and I rely on your not having reacted, I rely on your acquiescence, then I can get off the hook if, if a claim is brought against me in equity. And what I want to make here as a point is that the Métis absolutely did not acquiesce, and that quite to the contrary, the Crown acted to force them to stop bringing this claim, as opposed to, you know, relied on any, any acquiescence. <clears throat> so what happens? In 1911, Métis and Alberta in Lesser Slave Lake um, asked for uh, a royal commission to investigate script fraud. In 1920, uh, there's another petition from Fort Resolution, Fort Smith, and Fort Chippewan asking for a royal commission to investigate script fraud. Um, Frank had other examples yesterday. But basically, the general response to this is that um, fraud was a case-by-case -case issue. Fraud was not um, sort of endemic in the system. I would argue it was endemic in the system. But at, at the time, the Crown saying, you can't bring this as a collective case. If you want to look into script fraud, bring it as an individual case. And so that is what Métis and Alberta do. They, they bring an individual case against uh, Richard Secord, who was known as Edmonton's millionaire school teacher. 
because despite having his school teacher salary, he had made millions on uh, script fraud and script speculation. A case is brought against him uh, by a making man from Wabaska, uh, saying that he had induced a half-breed woman uh, with $10 and a gray shawl to impersonate a grantee for the purposes of locating a script coupon. Uh, there's a, there's a pretrial hearing and Richard Secord is let out on $5,000 bail. $5,000 in 1921 is serious money. He was a millionaire after all. Um, but it just goes to show that the case was being taken very seriously and it was going to trial. <clears throat> and the powers that be lose it. Uh, they're across the prairies, um, kind of the great institutions and families had benefited from uh, script speculation and script fraud and they were became very nervous. So um, Senator James Lougheed, Peter Lougheed's grandfather, pushes through in the Senate of Canada an amendment to the criminal code uh, that would make it impossible to prosecute script fraud. And he explains why he did it. He says, it is urged that there were a great many irregularities amounting to fraud and perjury in connection with the location of these lands. Uh, the fraud and the perjury is no secret. Uh, and the parties are raking up these frauds for the purposes of blackmailing. Blackmailing, I think, is the word that he used for um, justice coming home to roost. So they amend the criminal code. Uh, the way they do this is kind of uh, through a technicality. They say they change the limitation period on uh, when a case could be uh, prosecuted for a script fraud to uh, three years. Now, all of the script fraud had taken place have kind of at least 10 years earlier, making it functionally impossible for any of these people to face justice. And what's the fallout? I mean, the fallout is, and we talked about this yesterday, the fallout is that the Métis are disenfranchised and dispossessed. Their land was taken from them and worked through the gears of the capitalist economy and protected by the powers that be. And Métis, in the eyes of the government, end up squatting on crown land. They end up squatting on road allowances at the edges of new towns that are popping up throughout the prairies, and this is when they become known uh, as the road allowance people. Uh, this ought to be much better known. It is known to anyone that has looked into the situation. It is not known to the public at large. But the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples articulates what happens here. The majority of the Métis were reduced to squatting on the fringes of Indian reserves and white settlements and on road allowances. The independent ones, who had been diplomats and brokers of the entire Northwest were now being referred to as the road allowance people. Jason put this picture up yesterday just to give a, a human face to what had happened. And again, anyone that has looked at the issue has been struck by the injustice. This is obiter, um, which is to say a comment the court did not have to make but made anyway from the Supreme Court of Canada in the Blay case where they said that the history of script speculation and devaluation is a sorry chapter in our nation's history. What might the remedy be? So the remedy here, because of the nature of this claim, wouldn't be five million acres of land. It wouldn't be the value of that land at the time script was issued brought forward to today in money. The remedy would be a declaration. And how uh, it was a declaration that was issued in the Manitoba Métis Federation case. In that case, the declaration was that the federal crown failed to implement the land grant provision set out in section 31 of the Manitoba Act in accordance with the honor of the crown. And the Métis Nation of Alberta, if it pursues this case successfully, could rely on that declaration as a springboard for negotiations, as a springboard for trying to figure out what could be done in terms of money and land and jurisdiction and um, other gestures of reconciliation to somehow set right this wrongful history. Thank you very much. All right, are there any questions? While you're making your way to the microphone, thank you very much, Zach. That was a great presentation.
Good morning, everyone. I'm Lewis Bellows. I'm from the Peace River country. And uh, the town of Gruart is my hometown, where Treaty 8 was signed, and I guess 110 years ago. I had a story yesterday about it, what my grandfather did when uh, most of you have heard it. But the other part of the story, I'll finish what happened that day. The information I have is from grandfathers, elders, the last 82 years. And that's where I got the information about that day. After uh, Treaty 8 was signed, the Métis were also there. But they hadn't uh, gotten anything. They didn't sign nothing. So uh, one old man got up and asked, Tanska Totawanawak, Apetawarsanak. He said, what are we going to do with the half-breeds? Another guy got up and he said, the surveyors came west and the surveyors used boats and they used the boundaries as rivers, rivers as boundaries for the reserves. So he said, why don't we do the same thing for the Habreed and use Eastbury River and the Sucker Creek as boundaries. Big Meadow was populated by Métis at the time when they came west from Batash and Gruard. And there was lots of Métis people there. So that's what happened. But, like you gentlemen has been explaining about the fraud that went on, eventually, my dad said it was sometimes a bottle of whiskey was bought with that piece of paper, the script, which is 140 acres of land, or 240 sometimes. You mentioned the name I was not going to mention today, one of the, uh, Mr. Jack did, uh, Davis. His grandfather, he became premier of the province. And, uh, my dad said they lived in Calgary and they'd bring two teams of wagon loads of stoves, wood stoves. And they'd give one stove for one piece of land. But my dad said it was only business. It wasn't fraud, but he'd come every year. He eventually owned most of Calgary, and Banff, and Lake Louise. But uh, now that it's 100 years ago, I'm talking about 120. Like Mr. Isaac mentioned that we don't have too much, as much rights as the government, as the Indian people and the Eskimos, but just about. I think he mentioned uh, a few times the legal aspects of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the script now, 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 nowadays, 
I'm not sure uh, how to uh, to ask the question about uh, about when they give us that land in Big Meadow. <laughs> Was it uh, was when Treaty Eight was signed, uh, the Indian Act, um, that day? My dad, uh, we lived there all our lives on that land until my dad died, and we owned it as a lease. And he made hay on that land for years, and as a farm. Still, nobody lives on that land. But uh, what I guess I'd, I'd like to uh, know from Mr. Isaac is all the work you people did and you say uh, it comes to... Uh, the word uh, about uh, residential school, the uh, rec reconciliation. You mentioned a few times that we're getting uh, headway on that about reconciliation with the government. So uh, as survivors of the uh, residential school, a lot of us people are still alive, and we'd like to hear how that's going with the government. Are they happy? And uh, but I, I'm glad also the uh, what Mr. Isaac and, and Davis mentioned that education is the best thing to do for our for our nation. You know, our kids get educated. The, uh, I guess the, the thing about language is uh, I'm an interpreter for the uh, residential school process. But, uh, you know, it, uh, the, the uh, language I think is very, very important because we're losing it. Our kids don't speak Cree, and eventually we're going to lose, lose our language, which is a, a very beautiful thing in our nation. So I'd like to uh, thank you for uh, saying that uh, the, uh, the language is very important. Thank you very much. Just a comment. Um, hello? Uh, yeah, just a comment on the uh, residential school uh, issue. Um, if you look at the list that was on the PowerPoint presentation that I referred to, there wasn't a single example of uh, advancement on the residential school issue. So I, I wouldn't include uh, that issue as part of the progress that we've seen made. For those of you familiar with the Isle of La Crosse uh, situation, uh, that is one where there, you know, there are efforts underway to try to get that issue on the radar of Canada uh, and the government of Saskatchewan, both governments. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll see some headway there. But it's clearly an area that, again, in, at least in my view, we have not seen headway on, and we are probably not on the right track on, and that we need to get on the right track. I would only also add, uh, and I've made this very, you know, this, I guess you could almost call it a bit of a pitch, but it's, it's really, I think there's a very strong argument behind it that if we're serious about all these issues around governance and financial reform and uh, all the kinds of good things that, again, we're seeing evidence on, we have to have healed communities. And uh, my experience lately dealing with the Day Scholar uh, litigation, uh, which is public in terms of my involvement on the Gottfriedson uh, case, which does not include Métis, but has really opened my eyes very personally to the direct link between 
healthy people and governance reform and Section 35 rights implementation, there, at least in my experience, there is now a direct link between those two things. So again, going back to my point about a whole of government approach, uh, all of these issues need to be dealt with and we need to see progress on them. So uh, I, I wouldn't include um, uh, the Métis experience in residential schools among uh, the better examples. And it's one that we, I think, as a country need to make more progress uh, on. Hi, my name is David Parent. Uh, I'm a student here in the Faculty of Native Studies. Uh, my family comes from a small place called Minnewaukee in the Interlake region. It's what I do research on, but I was really interested by uh, your talk, Mr. Isaac. Um, w as someone who studies Métis issues, uh, I was a little worrisome around your pitch for the re like making uh, Métis more distinct that given the history of dispossession based on distinction and how distinction has really been used as a technique and tool to further separate Métis and dislocate Métis from their own indigeneity, which uh, is something that uh, many scholars in this room have rallied against for the past decade and I'm just wondering how much you consulted that scholarship in seeing how the dislocation of Métis from indigeneity furthers this this problem and um, yeah just how much you've reflected or you or you were reflecting on that when you made these decisions um, yeah it's it's just a huge issue when you started talking about that I was thinking to myself well the problem is, and I was actually talking to my friend Chelsea yesterday about this, and the fact that we consistently get categorized as separate from First Nations and Inuit is more of the problem rather than actually being distinct as a people. And earlier you used the word peoples, and I just correct, I just wanted to correct and say it's people uh, as a nation, right? And I'm just, yeah, and. So, so there's so there's that issue, and I'm wondering how much our nationhood is actually being affected by these recommendations to further distinction. Uh, thank you uh, for your question. Um, yeah, first of all, my use of the term "peoples" with an "s" uh, is a reference to the international law connotation. So, I. You know, it's my, uh, if it offended anyone by me saying peoples as opposed to people, I use peoples because of its international law meaning, um, but totally respect that people may refer uh, to themselves without uh, the S. In terms of the distinction, um, I would actually take a very different uh, viewpoint to some extent. So the distinction point isn't that they are distinct outside of indigenous peoples or aboriginal peoples. It's the point that governments to date, historically, uh, have uh, uh, not, and, 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 and they've, they've not uh, acknowledged uh, the distinct nature of Métis as an aboriginal people or peoples, or as an indigenous people or peoples. So the point isn't to say that they aren't you know, Aboriginal or, or Indigenous. Um, the point is, is that the uh, it becomes a cover for not treating Métis equitably, and the evidence abounds. Uh, and so it's the very point that, well, Métis are part of Aboriginal peoples, and look at all the Aboriginal programs that we've got. We don't have to worry about Métis peoples. Uh, when in fact, again, what I heard, and, and I've not seen evidence yet to the contrary, uh, although there, I'm sure that there are some examples, but uh, is that that sort of aboriginal title was actually used as a convenient cover for not dealing with Métis. So uh, I make the comment in my report that uh, at the time it was called uh, uh, in, uh, Indigenous uh, Affairs. Uh, yet there was very little indigenous about it. It was primarily First Nations affairs and Inuit affairs. So the very term 
uh, at least in terms of the evidence that, that I was able to see, was actually used as, and I, I'll use this as a, the phrase I would say, or the word I would use, is as a cover for not having to treat Métis with respect, with honor, uh, treat Métis peoples uh, equitably. Uh, and by the way, we're not done. I'm not at all suggesting, oh gee, everything's better now. And, uh, but my only point was that I think, at least federally, we have seen some evidence that treating Métis as a distinct Aboriginal people. So that is to say, for example, the comprehensive claims policy. The existing policy has no room for Métis peoples. Uh, and uh, that needs to change. But it needs to change on the fact that Métis as an Indigenous or an Aboriginal peoples are distinct. They're not derivative from, and again, one of the comments I didn't make, and I'll just I'll stop after this point, but I, uh, one of the other myths I kept hearing uh, was, well, Métis rights are derivative from First Nation rights. And it's false. As, as a matter of law, it's false. That's not what the Supreme Court of Canada has said. Métis rights exist as Métis rights, as distinct Métis rights that are not dependent upon First Nation or Inuit. It doesn't mean that Métis aren't part of a broader Indigenous. I'll leave it to the Métis to leave. I'm not, I won't wade into those waters. But uh, my point was more of a legal point on, on this. And it doesn't provide cover anymore for governments to go, well, we're dealing with indigenous peoples, even though a fraction of 1% of our money is actually dedicated to one of those three broad group of indigenous peoples. So that was all, that's, that's fundamentally what my, what my point was. Okay, I just want to note, like, you don't have to wait in, or you're already in the waters, though. <laughs> I mean, that may be correct. <laughs> and, and, but also, when you use peoples, you severely disturb those waters, too. <laughs> so. All right, thank you. We'll take the uh, remaining questions of, uh, from the people uh, waiting in line at the microphone, and then we'll move to uh, some questions from the live feed. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Ferguson. I'm from Gruard, I'm a student here in Edmonton. Uh, my question is to the fraud uh, situation that had happened to uh, some of our, our family. But I have two certificates here. I have one land grant that was given to my grandfather's grandfather at the signing of 1899 in Gruard. I have also here uh, from the Half Week Commission 248 uh, money script that was given to his wife. There was another three land grants that were supposed to be issued to other family members. I have the documentation for that. And another four manuscripts that were supposed to be given to other members that signed with Father Lacombe witnessing. Anywho, as far as my knowledge is, there was only one 160-acre parcel of land that was actually given to Daniel Ferguson. The other three, you know, there you go. Was that fraud or, or what was it? Just non-compliance by the commission or whatever. But anyway, my point is, there's clearly an injustice here done to my family. Uh, the Métis Nation of Alberta, I've approached and given them my my information and um, other members. But what I got here today was this injustice is going to be accepted as a declaration for the Métis Nation. And it's just going to be, I'm going to be swept under the carpet again? Um, or what are my chances to fight this myself or my family? I have the proof. You are supplying me with part of the, uh, the, the wood to have the fire. Uh, I'm, I'm in a really, um, and I'm in a corner again. My family's in a corner again. We've lived this way since 1899. And it seems that I know the Métis Nations got the right thing in their heart to 
to uh, get this injustice done. But in a case-by-case -case basis, there are some that are more that, and, and the other ones are less. I'm not saying about entitlement, but this is proof that there was an injustice. So I guess my question is, uh, us as a Métis, a nation of Alberta, with this injustice that was done to uh, the first families, are we accepting a declaration that the Métis nation is going to uh, accept this responsibility and uh, you know fight for it? And then se separate it in a case-by-case -case basis once, once there is a settlement brought through, I guess. Thank you, for your, thank you for your question. And I think it's a really important one because it's one that comes up a lot. We talk about sort of the collective injustice and that was done to people. It was done to families. And everyone stands up and says, well, what about my family? And this is obviously about righting the wrong that was done to all of those families. But because of legal impediments, it's necessarily something that needs to be advanced together. So the case that I kind of sketched out is based on what happened at the Supreme Court in Manitoba Métis Federation. And it's important to note that in that case, the Manitoba Métis Federation was a plaintiff, but also were a bunch of individuals who were descendants of people whose families had been dispossessed as a result of non-compliance with the land grant. And what the court said is that none of those individuals could pursue the claim because for the individuals, they were statute barred. Um, you know, I talked about some defenses that Canada could put up. On those individual cases, the claim couldn't be advanced, but that there was an overarching unconstitutionality around the Crown's behavior, and that could be advanced by the collective, as represented by the MMF. So it's not like there's no avenue here, um, but the avenue is something that needs to be pursued by you all working together as a collective, because otherwise you fall down on legal technicalities. After that, I think there's going to be a robust democratic discussion inside the Métis Nation about what happens to any benefits that can be negotiated as a result of the script claim, and that I don't want to wade into you know, at this point. Um, but the, what the Supreme Court told us in MMF is, it's not like there's no avenue, but it must be pursued by you all together. Hi, uh, Corey Ann Pruden, Morn, Veronica Morn, Usamania, Region 1. Um, I'd like to know what about the land leases that were signed 100 years ago? Wouldn't that confirm? Because my grandfather was one of those scripted people in Lac La Biche. I actually have the reference number and proof amongst uh, about 70 to 80 names from the mission and the museum. And how would we go about um, collectively going from each community in Alberta? and collecting all our people and saying, if you got scripts, you know, let's, let's have a meeting, maybe this coming assembly, and uh, bring your proof. Let's put it all on the table. Let's collaborate and build a stronger nation. Because um, where I come from, and when you're to Isaac, uh, when you talk about residential schools, I come from a legacy where my Cookham's, re my Cookham's identity changed three times, federal, provincial, federal. So I, I, uh, when it comes to humanity, when we talk about humanitarian, biological, psychological, socio-economical, there's no congruences psychologically to our identities, to the land base, to who we are. I'm glad I went to university, eh? Hey, hey. So, <laughs> but that's a big part of what's happening to our people. So what's going to happen to the next generation? There's children in the field standing alone that don't know whether or not to be, you know, either First Nation or, or can't be Métis or these types of situations. Where does that legacy lead us? So I'm really happy that we got this far and finding, um, validating the proof that our scripted land was taken from us, which can state to the government or, or all these agencies that were incongruent to our identity, which is Métis or half-breed or even um, First Nation. 
and I see and I see that. But these land leases, I know there was land leases all over. Lac La Biche is one of them. St. Paul, Lake St. Anne, Gruard, and wherever all of us live. But there's historical ties, and those historical ties are very important to creating a congruent, strong Métis identity where the government doesn't or can't, won't, we won't allow them to say, well, you're only half a half, because that's what's happening here. So how do we justify that? Anyone? I, I can't justify it, obviously. <laughs> Um, but I, I do think that the comment underlines something really important. It is my opinion that part of the script system, part of the idea of the script system, and the reason there was such a blind eye paid to how it resulted in the disenfranchisement of Métis people, was it was designed to make Métis people disappear. The, the idea was that if you kind of took their land away, they would integrate into white society and Métis people would disappear. And uh, that didn't happen because you are a resilient nation. And now Canada, you know, it's 100 years later and you still exist and you are still proud of your heritage and you're digging into it and you're finding your congruence in this history. And now it's something that Canada has to deal with. Good morning, my name is Bev New, Métis Nation, Region 5. I wanna talk about my family and my family is a Métis Nation of Alberta. I want to go back to May of 1870, when the Manitoba Act was signed, when the Rupert's land was supposed to be protected for the Métis people, when they talked about lands outside of Rupert's land was for the other people, but the Rupert's land was for us Métis people. When I hear about a declaration being a, a springboard, it just makes me think, why would we even go there? Why would we not channel, challenge the Manitoba Act? When I think about land and they say, oh, well, maybe there's not enough land to give to the Métis people for what they've been cheated out of. There's a lot of land. We negotiated 148 acres in Region 5 known as the Kathleen land. We have Frost Hills Integrated Plan 100 square miles that can be utilized for Métis people. So I think my point here today is, I think us as a Métis nation, we need to go back to when Louis Riel was developing a provisional government in 1870. That was intended to develop a government for the Métis Nation people across Canada or within the Rupert's land. So when I think about these tactics, stall tactics, I'm going to call them that. Because when I think about that springboard and that declaration, how long are we talking to actually physically see a declaration? But on top of that, even once the declaration comes out, how long are we looking at before we even negotiate anything within that declaration? So when I think about the Métis Nation, I think about the Manitoba Act. I think about the provisional government that was expected to be built. It's time for us as a Métis Nation to challenge the government under the Manitoba Act. Our Métis, our harvesting, our Métis rights to hunt. We need to challenge that as a right, not as a policy with Alberta. So as a Métis Nation of Alberta, I encourage our people, yes, let's work together. Yes, let's develop a strong case, and yes, let's take the government to court once and for all, challenge that Manitoba Act, because there was supposed to be a treaty signed for the Métis people. So when we talk about, I've been in Métis Nation 26 years. I was a president of Region 5, 19 years. And I can honestly say, after all of this time, putting 26 years into our Métis Nation, we need to have rights for the Métis people. And the rights have to fall out of the Manitoba Act where we had promises from the government back then. And just to educate some of the people who may not know, let's talk about the Rupert's land. The Rupert's land was land put aside for the Métis people. It was supposed to be protected. But the way I read it, and somebody could correct me if I'm wrong because I took it off of Google, of course. <laughs> but the Rupert's land, The way I understand it, they needed a body to get access to that land and to buy that land. So the Hudson Bay Company came up. And how much was that Rupert's land sold for to the Hudson Bay? 13,000 British pounds. How much money is that? So the Rupert's land that was supposed to be protected for the Métis people was sold that they needed a body. And like I'm saying, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the Hudson Bay paid the government money and took over the Rupert's land. So when we're talking Métis Nation, we're talking laws and we're talking land for our people, it's not about the money. 
It's about what injustice was done to our people. So yes, let's go to court and yes, let's get our land. They say, oh, there's not enough land. Oh, maybe we can negotiate out of a declaration. Keep it all. Let's go to court and get our land. Thank you. Um, we'll go to uh, the live stream. Um, Heather asks, provincially, what should we be asking of our MLAs in order to best represent the needs of Métis people and address the modern remedy of script settlements? I think that's a really relevant question, um, given that we're going into a provincial election. I think you should all reach out to your MLAs, to all of the candidates that are running, and say, you vote based on Métis rights and respect for the Métis nation. The province in Alberta has been, I think, egregious in dragging out recognition for Métis people. They have a constitutional obligation to treat the Métis as equals in respect of harvesting rights in a way that conforms with the jurisprudence and to consult with Métis people, and they don't do it. They don't do it because they think it's politically dangerous. They are afraid of uh, hunting and fishing associations, and they are afraid of backlash from First Nations. But you know, political anxiety is not an excuse for evading constitutional obligations. I think the only way to do it is to let your MLA know. We'll get uh, to, could I, oh, yeah, sorry. Could I, just, I just want to add, I completely agree with Zachary on that. I mean, I, uh, Alberta is a challenge. I mean, for those of you involved in the consultation process, you know that the government of Alberta's views around the duty to consult uh, the Métis on Section 35 issues does not conform with the law as we know it. And there is uh, an unhealthy fixation with uh, the treaties in Alberta. And what I mean by that is, I, I don't mean that at all to say that the treaties should not be focused on by government. But it can't be focused on to the extent that you ignore another constitutional set of rights. And uh, my own experience in Alberta is I've, I've seen numerous examples of this. And, uh, you know, eventually it will stop. And hopefully it'll be sooner rather than later. But I uh, completely agree with what Zachary said. I would be quite vocal uh, with your uh, uh, MLAs and your political system to ensure that the law is being adhered to and that people's uh, views are not clouded by what might appear to be more politically expedient in terms of the relations with, uh, with uh, First Nations or others uh, in the province. And again, not intended at all to be a, a comment negative towards First Nations. My focus isn't on them. My focus is on the public government, which has an obligation to treat both First Nations and Métis equally with respect. All right, thank you. One more from the uh, live stream. Uh, Rachel asks, is it possible to find the names of individuals who may have set up accounts with the Dominion Lands Office? Frank says yes, so I'll leave Uh, yeah, thanks, Zach, for actually highlighting one of the interesting things about the money script and how that was handled. But in the land boom in, uh, in the late 1900s, certain speculators like Al Wayne Champion, McDougall and Secord were set up accounts to reduce the transaction costs and facilitate the movement of um, money script. And it could be deposited, value could be deposited in various Dominion land offices. And this is because the value of manuscript was very low vis-a-vis -vis the amount of land you could acquire. These accounts were set up. I actually had my wife, Amy Lamb, who's a chartered accountant, look at it very quickly. And the accounts sort of end, and her view was there was a lack, taking a kind of modern auditing approach, there was a lack of documentation to back up what was going on there. So if you want to know those names, they're not, they're the names of the big spectators. You can do. It's one of those little research projects we haven't had time to sort of thoroughly flush out. All right. Uh, just before we come back to the mic in the main room for our final question, we do have a question from the Glacier Room. 
Um, good morning. My name is Norma Collins, and I'm from Elizabeth uh, Settlement. I have a question about the um, children's rights. In, in Manitoba, they had the uh, original white settlers who got script, and their children's rights were protected up until they were age 21. And I'm wondering why the Métis children's rights were not protected. Also, it seems that uh, <clears throat> the deceased children, the speculators wanted their lands. And so they were allowed to uh, get land, the script for deceased children. And I think that was like totally wrong. And the government allowed it and the speculators got the land. So then the original white settlers got land for deceased children. This is totally unfair. So we do have a lot to um, fight for here with this uh, script process. Thank you. With respect to the Manitoba Act, I think the Manitoba Act did provide robust protections for the land rights of Métis children. That was one of the key promises that was negotiated by the provisional government. The issue isn't that there was no promise of protection. The issue, frankly, I think, was racism. Uh, the government at the time didn't really want the Métis to take the foothold that they were promised. They wanted white Protestant English settlers to take that foothold, and so they protected the land rights of those children more than they protected the land rights of the Métis. All right, our final question at the mic. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Billy Gibosh. I'm a Métis from Manitoba. Uh, my concern is at what point I agree with Mr. Isaac saying uh, education. And from what I've gathered from this conference so far is uh, this whole uh, government uh, induction has been a sham. Uh, First on education, we not only need to educate ourselves as we are today, but we also need to educate the incoming generations. What is being done to educate our children, our future grandchildren, in, in, in terms of uh, schooling, in terms of more, more education such as this? And also, from my experience in life is wherever you go in life, you, as an analogy, you need, a, uh, you need an entrance fee. And I believe, uh, I, I've never filled out an, an, an immigration form to come to Canada the way the new immigrants have. And I, I don't know what, what content is in there. And it doesn't matter to me, but now it does, is uh, they do, I'm, Sure, they ask uh, questions about the indigenous people, and there's probably maybe two, three lines of it, and that's about it. But I think with the incoming influx of immigration that it should, there should be something in there to educate the new immigrants about the Métis people, not just who is your first prime minister. Uh, in my opinion, our first prime minister was real. And uh, so in short, so in short, we not only need to, oh, before I go any further, I've always told my people, if I can't lead my people, I'll get my, t my, I'll get my children to lead my people. And they're going to, and we need that through education. Now what is being done in the school system, for starters, to get that instilled? If, if in any school, not just Métis schools, in any school. And also, the, admit, the, the entrance fee that immigrants must pay, must, and I mean must pay, is that they need to know about our plight, our uh, rough times that we went through. They need to know that because you know what? I can go anywhere in this city, in this country, and I could bring up Métis, and you know what? They know crap about it. We need to get that instilled. What and where are we at with those two? 
issues? Um, I think on the education stuff, I know we do have people from Rupert Line Institute, our education council, if they would maybe want to go to the mic and answer that, it might be helpful. I, I just want to offer an anecdote though, um, because my wife uh, is, a re is a lawyer as well, she's a refugee lawyer, and she works with refugees. And she had a woman in her office one day saying that her daughter was having a hard time integrating, but that she did have a favorite topic in school. And her favorite topic in school was learning about indigenous people. Uh, and I found that really heartwarming. She, as a refugee in Canada, saw herself in some of the plight that indigenous people in Canada had suffered. Hi, everyone. Um, I didn't really come prepared to share anything formal, but um, I work with uh, Rupert Sound Institute, Métis Centre of Excellence, with the newly established education, um, education force. I won't even try to say education department. Um, and so really, we've kind of been taking the opportunity that Métis people have been sort of following um, and let's start as a program, let's evolve this to some sort of a level that will reach the kids that are in our classrooms. Um, sorry, so recently there's been an update in the teaching quality standard and so teachers are required now to have an understanding about the legislation and agreements made with Métis. So that we're trying to condense all of these and other uh, legislations and agreements and pare that down into bite-sized pieces for all teachers in Alberta for um, their class use in the classroom from K to 12. It's a really big endeavor to do and we need a lot of help in doing that and so um, we are going to be reaching out and please, um, you know, I hope by next year at this time everybody knows about who we are and everybody's had a chance to kind of chime into the, the dialogue that we'll be having so that whatever reaches the classrooms of K-12 to in Alberta is coming from um, our communities and it's informed from all of these uh, history and legislations that have come to be and we're doing that from a place that um, Métis people are the foundation of that and while we help everybody to kind of sort through all of the tangled mess that a lot of these um, legislations and agreements have kind of driven us to, um, we hope that there's a more general understanding about this and that the upcoming generations can continue on the work that will need to continue to happen. Thanks. Thank you. All right, one last comment, question, and we do have to take a break. Uh, Krista, ooh, is this on? Krista Letty, uh, my family comes from St. Albert, Lac St. Anne. Um, I also work in education, and I need to rebut that. Um, the TQS is a great start, but <laughs> that includes all Indigenous teaching, so First Nation, Métis, and Inuit. And um, in my experience, Métis, we are forgotten. We are forgotten in our education system. We are a footnote. We are um, two pages in a textbook. What we need to do as citizens, as Métis people, as parents, as aunties and uncles and cookums and mushums, we need to go to your school, to your trustees, to your kids' teachers and demand that Métis be included in the education. If that means that you have stories to share, volunteer in the school. Hold the school boards accountable. Hold Alberta Education accountable. Hold the ATA accountable to get that Métis information and real information in those schools. Sorry, I'm very passionate about this, um, but it's we, we have to be loud and proud. We have to be out there and we have to be, uh, we have to be visible because that's the problem. We're not seen and we're not heard. So we need to take back that power. Thank you. Great. All right, it's uh, just about 11 o'clock. We'll come back at 11.15. We will get back on track with the schedule because of our next panel. We just, one of our uh, panelists wasn't able to make it. And uh, so we'll be able to get back up on, uh, on schedule. So one uh, last time, give them a nice round of applause here for our panelists. Thank you very much. And we'll be back in 15 minutes. <laughs>